Clementi was the great uh, Italian composer who lived in London, had a piano factory and also a piano student factory, a mill. <laughs> and he's writing the same stuff, these mechanical, mechanical exercises zooming up and down in every scale, in every key, and chords and then arpeggios. Here's, here's again the level of interest. It's so mechanical and it's, you know, it's kind of mind numbing to do that. So I just, I said, mm, not for me, <laughs> refused to do them. Uh, Cause what I wanted to play was Beethoven and Chopin and Mussorgsky and Bach and all kinds of, other, you know, real music. So Chopin's, Chopin was completely the opposite. He said, the body is not a machine. And I think what saved him was he's largely self-taught. He was not a product of these piano mill type teachers like Clementi and Cherney and all the rest of them. His first big teacher was a violinist and they studied Bach and Mozart. They played from scores, they did the well-tempered clavier and Chopin was encouraged to improvise and explore and teach himself and he learned the topography, the whole shape of the keyboard and invented ways of doing things, which ended up being revolutionary. It's kind of the difference between the, the exercise mantra of the 70s. You remember no pain, no gain? Well, a lot of people hurt themselves and got tendonitis and, and all kinds of terrible injuries. No pain, no pain. Pain it means you're doing something wrong. You're really doing something wrong. Also, no excessive practice. Six and seven hours a day is punishing. Chopin said, never more than three, and not all at once. Read a book, go to a museum, look at a piece of art. Turn yourself into a complete human being, you know, and educate yourself completely, culturally. Don't just mechanically repeat these things. And also, the brilliant thing about him was he realized, yeah, the five fingers are all different. You're never going to make them the same. So why not just capitalize on the particular characteristics of each finger, which is a brilliant thing to do. So you just, you go with nature. You don't fight it. You don't try to change nature. You go with it and use it. And that's what he achieved. And as a teacher, he was really brilliant because not only did he have this kind of natural approach and dedication to his students, he was very good psychologically with them and he knew how to encourage them and bring them to their best level as opposed to oh there's a wonderful quote now where did i find it um ah oh, was it there's one of these writers saying that uh, chopin you know he he was too modest and and too what ambivalent he didn't want to press his personality and press his ideas on anyone. He was very content to let them try things their own way and say, hmm, that's interesting. I, I can hear it that way too. It's not the way I would do it, but I can hear that. And whenever he demonstrated, he never played anything the same way twice. It was always full of fantasy and invention and creativity and freedom. Whereas what the other writer, I'll, I'll think of it later, said Liszt had this huge school of students and he left his lion's claws on all of them. Mm. So they were, they were strictly molded in the image of Liszt and the way he played things and the way he trained and there was, there was none of this zen, you know, <laughs> go with nature and everyone has some valid point of view and just don't overdo it. So they're completely opposite, opposite approaches to music and to the piano. Um, have some wonderful reviews by, of, of the Parisian virtuoso school in Paris in the early 1830s when, you know, Chopin just arrived there and he's 23 years old and uh, has to establish himself in a field of hundreds, literally hundreds of pianists who are competing for work and attention and press coverage. And Heinrich Heine, the acid tongued acid poison pen writer 
of poetry and music criticism has captured what this scene was like in Paris. And he was rough on all of them. He compared the Par Paris virtuosos to, quote, a plague of locusts swarming to pick Paris clean. He wrote a series of essays about the whole scene called Musicalische Berichte aus Paris and published them with tremendous satire and sarcasm. He went after everybody. He accused uh, the pianist Dreischock of creating an infernal racket, three times three score pianist. And uh, he said, <laughs> since the wind on the evening of Dreischock's concert lay in a southwesterly direction, you could have heard him in Augsburg. Go hang yourself, Franz Liszt. <laughs> because Franz Liszt was, of course, famous for smashing pianos, making a huge volumes of sound, storms of sound. Kalkbrenner, remember Kalkbrenner was the older man who offered to teach Chopin and polish him, finish him? Kalkbrenner was dispatched in a couple of sentences. Quote, he's like a bonbon that has fallen in the mud. There's nothing wrong with it, but everybody leaves it where it lies. Another man, Pixis, Heine declared, his pretty melodies were so simple they were eagerly sought after by dealers in canaries who could teach their caged friends to whistle them back in one day to the delight of their customers. Henri Hertz, now he's the one who invented the dactylion piano finger torture machine. There's, a, there's an article about that and pictures of it in the links that I sent you in Hertz. He was grouped among the musical mummies saying he's been long dead, but was recently married. <laughs> Liszt and Thalberg were cut down to size. They had a piano duel, famous competition to see who was the greater pianist, and he called it a melancholy misunderstanding. Alfred de Musset, former lover of Georges Sand, the writer, was dismissed as a young man with a great future behind him. Now, this is pretty uniform, you know, devastating, criticism except for one person, Chopin. And of Chopin, he, there was, he could find nothing wrong. He thought he was the perfect musician and the perfect performer. He called him the Raphael of the piano. When he plays, this is quoting, I forget all other masters of the instrument of mere skill and sink into the sweet abyss of his music, into the melancholy rapture of his exquisite and profound creations. Chopin is the great and genial poet of sweet sound who should only be named with Mozart, Beethoven, or Rossini. Wow. <laughs> so, so it was rough out there and Chopin found his place by not competing. He was not interested in technique as an end in itself. He had absolutely no interest in it. Um, the other ones that, you know, that was a main event, the pursuit of technique for its own sake. I've given you some of his uh, advice for pianists, you know, never, never an extreme forte. Chopin could use a forte. It wasn't that he was too weak, but he held it in back and he held it in reserve for just the few measures of a climax for maximum effect. But if somebody's bashing away, he'd say, what is that? It sounds like a barking dog. It's just senseless sound. Um, always. Music is a language. Music is the language of the inexpressible. So every note needs to be shaped, caressed, thought about, think 10 times, then play once. Everything should be with intention, nothing automatic. Study great singers. So Chopin's goal was to make the piano sing. Um, and a piano is a percussion instrument. As soon as you strike a key, the sound begins to decay. So there are all kinds of ways you can create the illusion that this is a singing continuous line by the use of legato and dynamics and the pedaling and lots and lots of tricks that you learn. Plus, you need to, to listen to great singers, especially Italian opera singers, to learn that language of phrasing of prosody and of breathing and dynamics and shaping how to move forward and how to pull back 
with with sincere, profound expression. So this this is an art of acting, storytelling, making the piano speak, making the piano tell a story and sing. Um, there are some wonderful descriptions of his playing by his contemporaries beyond Heinrich Heine. So nice, I found a nice short one by Mendelssohn after, after those few days when they, we met with Hiller and they played for each other. He wrote to his mother, Mendelssohn did, and said, you know, both Hiller and Chopin are somewhat under the Parisian tendency of overdoing passion and despair and too often lose sight of calm, discretion, and the purely musical. I, on the other hand, perhaps do this too little. He knew himself well. He knew he was on the very conservative side of things. Let me play for you where I was, I was gonna play this last week and we ran out of time. Um, a Mendelssohn song called On Wings of Song. It's one of the songs without words. And like Schumann's Widmung, Liszt took it and made a transcription for piano solo. So the, the vocal line is embedded in the texture. And it's also a good example of what was called the three-handed effect, which Thalberg was very famous for, where you surround a melody with broken chords and arpeggios on either side, above and below, and then embed it in the middle. So the melody is being played in the middle of this texture, mostly by the thumbs, which share. And the tricky part is the choreography of working out when, when it's the left hand's turn and when it's the right hand's turn to play these notes so that you don't disconnect it in the middle. I'll just play you the opening of this. Um, Liszt did this and all he did was take the song, embed the melody in the middle, and then repeat it in octaves. But I won't do the whole thing, just the opening. And this is called On Wings of Song. lovely and that became very popular. Liszt took a lot of these songs without words and songs, songs of Schubert and Mendelssohn and Schumann and made transcriptions of them uh, to do it, piano solos which he used in his concerts. Now back to the descriptions of Chopin's playing as a pianist. There are just a f there's a huge collection here. Hiller, the friend the pianist friend that went uh, to the music festival and met Mendelssohn and the three of them spent all that time together. Hiller was a, a very close friend. But I must describe his wonderful playing, which will remain impressed on my soul until I draw my last breath. I have said that he rarely opened his heart out, but at the piano, he abandoned himself more completely than any other musician I have ever heard with such concentration that all extraneous thoughts simply fell away. Nobody before had stirred the keys of a piano like that, nor known how to release such countless sonorities from it. Uh, some other famous Berlioz, remember Berlioz is kind of on the fringes here, and uh, Chopin had played the benefit concert to help Harriet Smithson get some money to live on when she broke her leg. He writes, Chopin is an artist apart. His talent is of an entirely different nature from Liszt's. In order to appreciate him fully, 
I believe he has to be heard from close by in the salon rather than the concert hall. He bears no point of resemblance to any other musician I know. Chopin himself can play his music and give it an unusual turn in this sense, the sense of the unexpected, which is one of its principal beauties. His playing is shot through with a thousand nuances of movement of which he alone holds the secret, impossible to convey by instructions. Uh, list, not list. Um, Mikuli. Ah, Emil Gillard, one of his students. Thumping is not playing. Chopin never flattened his piano. And yet, under his fingers, everything came out wonderfully. While his left hand played a beautiful song straight from the heart, his right hand would seem casually to unfold a magnificent lacework of sound. Virtuosity disappeared behind the emotion. One was less dazzled and moved. Oh, gorgeous. And I think I have one, no, maybe that's enough. Yeah, that's enough. So you get the idea. I mean, there are many, many people, Delacroix, Georges Sand, Fontana, um, they, they all say basically the same thing. Balzac. Oh, this is the, this is good. You should judge Liszt only once you've had the opportunity to hear Chopin. The Hungarian is a demon. The Pole is an angel. Wow. Let's look at some pictures of these people we've been talking about. These are these 3D recreations by a guy who does um, movie, computer, you know, creations of things, used from photographs, death masks, and, and portraits. Liszt was about six feet tall, very skinny, very, very thin, angular features on this ash blonde shoulder length hair. Uh, Chopin was barely over five feet. He weighed about a hundred pounds. He, he mostly looked like a child, very slight, very frail. And Mendelssohn, of course, looking quite well put together, you know, the upper class, confident. Mendelssohn was the center of conservatism in Leipzig, of the very, very, very popular, very conservative kind of music that had a heavy debt to, to Mozart and Hummel. Liszt is exactly the opposite. He's pushing the boundaries of form and technique and harmony into what he calls, literally, the music of the future. And Chopin is almost a displaced person in this. Chopin is the immigrant who is self-taught, who adores Mozart and Bach and vocal music, belongs to no school, and is a Polish patriot with this incredible sense of fantasy. So he's completely unique. He doesn't, he doesn't fit anywhere. He's just doing his own thing and extremely demanding of himself in high standards so that today, almost everything that Chopin wrote is still in the repertoire, both for the concert stage and for teaching, whereas for the other two, it's narrowed down to a very short list of pieces which are still played. By the way, um, there was a concert organized when they were all still friendly where uh, Mendelssohn was, I think was gonna conduct and Liszt was gonna play his G minor concerto, his new concerto, and Liszt arrived a few days late. So he sight read the concert from the manuscript. Yes, now that tells you how brilliant a pianist he is and how easy, how totally in command, but it also tells you how predictable and well, fairly simple the Mendelssohn Piano Concerto in G minor is compared to what Chopin was writing. So, they, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic feat to have done that. Um, so they were, they were all friendly for a while, and then, you know, as the years went on, they fell apart. Let's go ahead. Next image. Ah, the watch. When Chopin was nine, not quite ten years old, 
there was a concert by the world famous diva, Italian opera singer Angelica Catalani. She came to Warsaw, it was her first time in November and stayed through January. And she stayed at the home of a relative and gave four really important concerts in December. Chopin attended, and then there was a house concert on January 3rd at the home of her, you know, the, the people she was staying with. And Chopin was there, this little boy, and after she sang, she invited him to play. And she was so impressed with him, she gave him this gold watch and said, you will be, you will be a great artist. <laughs> and that meant so much to him, this little boy. He kept this watch all his life. And I think now it's in the, the Chopin Museum in, in Warsaw, where a lot of his other things were just sold off or, or lost or auctioned off when he died. This watch was a precious, precious thing. But he loved Italian opera singers. So that was, that was the beginning. It started when he was nine years old. Okay, next one. That's his last piano. He bought it just before he went to London in 1848, and he was teaching lessons on it in the, the little studio apartment in the Square d'Orléans in Paris. And then he had it shipped to London, and he played his first concert on it there. Um, and then when he finished that tour, he sold it, and it stayed in the UK, Scottish people, English people, and so now it's owned by somebody named Cobb. Okay, next one is, that's a sketch now lost of his studio, and there's the piano, the very same Playel grand piano. At this point, Chopin was so weak that he lay on the chaise lounge divan. He would just lay on that sofa and when the students came for their lessons. And depending on his energy level, he may stay there or he may have gotten up and played for them. But in the early days, there were two pianos, a pianino, little spinet piano side by side with the grand. The student was allowed to play the beautiful playel grand piano and Chopin accompanied them or demonstrated on the pianino. Okay, next picture. There he is, 38, okay. Um, notice the posture, it's relaxed, it's slightly leaning back, arms level, fingers on the keys, very calm, very quiet. This was what he so admired about Kalkbrenner's playing when he first arrived in Paris and heard him play, is the man did the most stupendous things with a completely calm upper body and arms. Okay, next one. There, when he died, Auguste Claisonger, which was Solange Saint's husband, Georges Saint's son-in-law, immediately came that morning and made a death mask and a cast of his left hand. And people said the hands were small, actually, but that he had a fantastic range of motion. Both Hiller and Heine said when he opened his hands, it was like he could cover a third of the keyboard with the hand. <laughs> And they said it was like watching a snake open its jaws to swallow a rabbit. It was, he was just so loose that he could cover the keyboard with the hand. And he always emphasized suppleness, relaxation, calm, suppleness in playing. Okay, next one. There they are, the angel versus the demon. Even Balzac said. Um, yeah, completely opposite in character in approach to the keyboard, in approach to their teaching and in their music. And now, of course, Liszt was having a huge success in the 1840s. This Listomania took over Europe and he did hundreds of concerts, sometimes thousands of people clamoring to be there and following him in the streets, people going mad, acting like a, a rock concert, rock star. And Chopin is just quietly playing for groups of a dozen people in salon concerts, quiet, private, very intimate settings his whole life. Only 20 public concerts. Okay, next one. Here's the difference. This is a image of a salon concert in Poland. Chopin at the piano again, kind of leaning back, very relaxed, playing in about a dozen people. I counted <clears throat> 15 here. Candlelight, and this is late in the evening. Okay, next one. <laughs> Listomania, 1840s. The women especially just went berserk. They would have torn him 
to shreds. They wanted his gloves and his scarves and his cigar butts, and uh, people followed him all over. And Liz loved it. He just encouraged it. And of course, he was big on putting on a show. And there is a series of cartoons from a Hungarian comic newspaper. It's the next picture, which which take you through a concert of Liszt. He appears with a smile of conscious superiority. The first chord, brum, looking back to at the audience, looking at the audience as if to say, attention, I'm beginning now, next one. Now the drama, Hamlet's broodings, Faust struggles, deep silence. Chopin, George Sand, reminiscence, sweet youth, moonlight, fragrance, love, next picture, Dante's Inferno, wailings of the condemned, among them those of the piano. He often had two pianos on stage because he would break so many strings the first one and the first half that they'd have to exchange instruments to have a, a backup replacement. The gates of hell, boom. And at the end, finally, he has played not only for us, but with us. Retiring, he bows with lofty humility. Deafening applause. <laughs> Next one. I love this. I don't know what year this was done, but this <laughs> is pretty fantastic. This is old list with the, the Hungarian saber sword he was presented in Budapest when he went and played concerts for the relief of the flood victims of the Danube flood and destroying a piano with torrents of sound. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go to the piano. Bel canto, give you an example of a bel canto line, operatic and soul, especially the nocturnes. All of the right hand parts of the nocturnes are like operatic arias. There's one page in the Barcarolle that can illustrate several of his special techniques. In this one page, I've got the dolce sfogato, which means uh, it's kind of an unmeasured measure where it just says, let loose, let it go free there is a liberated thumb where you're, you're doing something, holding a note in the right hand, and then the thumb plays individual notes of an inner line. Of course, thumb on the black keys, that was, that was normal for him. Passing fingers over another, you have to do this in Bach when you play fugues anyway, that you frequently are trying to play a melodic line. Where are we here? So you may pass, how do I do this? the third finger over the fourth, you know, or the third finger over the second, or the fourth over the fifth, as you try to connect a line without a gap, without letting go. And of course, Chopin had also played the organ as a teenager, so he understood about finger legato. When you play the organ, if you let go of the key, nothing, because of course it's air going through the pipe. So you have to use a finger legato connection to keep the line intact um, and the pedaling halo of sound of wonderful pedaling okay let me do that last page of the of the bark roll for you to hear some of this starting with the, the lead-in to the dolce sfogato this fingering the thumb doing the inner line that pedaling and the uh, the rhythmic independence of the right hand part just being set free um, the organ style fingering is fun to show in the preludes in the in the Chopin preludes there's the G major prelude which I played for you in the fall and the left hand has a busy busy part that just more than 16th notes constantly and the right hand to connect the line, you're not going to use the pedal here. You have to connect it with your fingers. So you do what's known as a finger substitution, which is an organ style fingering. It's 
just just the fingers. In the famous B minor prelude with that sounds like a cello melody, the left hand has to do the same thing, substitute the fingers to keep the line going. Here's the bit of the B minor prelude. His pedaling effects were quite revolutionary. Sometimes there's a long pedal over a long a phrase that's a, really of some length. And on a modern piano, it might be too muddy, but on his piano, it just had this wonderful resonance, letting the sound ring. And I think, I think Chopin played with the piano in a way that took the best that was possible from the piano and played with those sounds created textures that leads directly to Debussy because this music is piano music. It's music that emerges from the piano. It's not music that's supposed to be a symphony played on the piano or music that you could transfer to any other instrument. It's uniquely suited for the, the sonority and the resonance of the piano. So here's the end of the D flat major nocturne it has this beautiful blended long pedaling, which many people don't dare to do today. They're afraid to do it because it, it creates a muddy sound. But if you do it carefully, I think it creates a beautiful halo of sound. It takes a little courage to do that, and, and of course it depends on the size of the room that you're playing in as well. The nocturnes are full of wonderful effects of rhythmic independence uh, of the right-hand line, which is completely derived from operatic style ornamentation and his improvisations. And that's why you get all these irregular groupings, you know, the 11 against 6 or 18 against six or eight or something like that of the right hand the small notes against the left hand and the left hand Liz said Chopin's rubato was something like a the trunk of the tree the left hand is quite stable and steady and the right hand is like the leaves and the branches so there can be more movement there can be more freedom rushing ahead and pulling back in the right hand but that the left hand should stay quite steady and everyone says that Chopin mostly played like this, but he also played with a tremendous amount of freedom. So who knows? Don't you wish <laughs> we had recording, recordings of that? Because n nobody really knows what he did, but the descriptions are quite magical and consistent. I want to play for you another bit of a nocturne. Um, there's some gorgeous examples. He, used, he said the third finger is a great singer. He would use it repeatedly on successive notes where, I mean, some people look at these fingers and they think, what, why do it that way? But that was, that was his idea of the character, the individual character of the fingers creates the different character of the notes. So there, there are two wonderful examples of doing that third finger repeating <clears throat> on successive notes I wanna play for you. Uh, and he writes it out, he's very clear, he writes it out in the book, three, three, three over the fingering so that, you know, the easy way would of course be to go three, two, one, but he wants to do that separation. Okay, here's the first one. This is the, the G minor nocturne, opus 37. <laughs> C minor 
nocturne starts, even starts with that one string. absolutely revolutionary at the time to do things like that. Um, in the, the famous early nocturne, I bet that all of you who studied your piano played the Opus 9 in E flat. He's got many of those little ornaments where he wants you to go five, 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 four, five. He, it's delicate and pianissimo, so he gives it to the two weakest fingers on the top because he wants a special color and a special dynamic level there. Let me just show you the, this one little phrase. You'll recognize the excerpt. absolutely perfect to do it that way. Another thing you get a lot of is irregular groupings. Three against four, four against three, five against eight, you know, 11 against eight, whatever. Um, two of the most famous examples are the, the Fantasy Impromptu, three against four, and then the Etude Nouvelle, the F minor, which is four against three. These are not um, virtuosic so much as it is working out a technical problem of a texture and trying to be nuanced about it at the same time. I'll just do you a tiny, a tiny example of each one so you can hear how that fits together. And the goal is complete independence of the hands. You don't want them stuck together, but moving freely, completely independently. So those are three, three and three in the left hand. in the right hand, right? And he wrote this beautiful etude in F minor for Moschels, who was doing, was doing a method of methods of pianos. And Chopin worked on this and contributed three little studies, which are anti-virtuosic, but they're beautiful. And this one I particularly love is the, the F minor, in which the right hand is all in triplets in threes, and the right hand is in groups of four. It's quite gorgeous. I, I'll play the whole thing for you. This takes all of two minutes, but it's really beautiful.
paired with that one, there's a lovely one in A-flat major, the relative major, and that's two against three. So these, these rhythmic studies for students, again, let me just play the opening of it. It's, it's lovely. I won't do the whole thing. Two against three in A-flat major. Another beautiful example of rhythmic ambiguity, is it threes or is it twos, and pedaling, this incredible pedaling where he, he lets it go for a long time, is uh, the slow movement of the B minor sonata. The other thing people don't talk about much is in, in his pedaling remarks in his pieces, there's amazing places where he puts no pedal. And I, that's hardly ever done today. People just put pedal on everything is like putting pancake syrup on everything on your plate. The piano without the pedal is another color. It's another another whole timbre and sonority that's available to you if you have the courage to use it. <laughs> and it's very tricky. It's not easy balancing going in and out of the, the wet sound of the pedal and the dry sound. And you have to use your fingers to control, obviously, the legato so that everything doesn't become disconnected and dry sounding. Um, but he was a genius at that, and very particular, very, very detailed instructions about no pedal and pedal. I love this middle section of the B minor sonata. Again, it kind of ambiguous, it, out of threes and twos, and a lovely middle melody. And then at the end, when it stops, he just drifts off and lets, lets everything blend, and it's like something evaporating and just floating up into the air as that section comes to an end.
that passage is interesting because of the long the long passage where there's big unrelieved pedaling and then long phrases where there's no pedal at all he wants you to do everything dry with a finger legato little chordal passages so very unusual and you don't often hear it done the way it's written almost everybody just uses pedal continuously all the way through um, apotheosis of themes oh that's a wonderful trick you hear this, uh, especially two beautiful examples are in, in the ballads where a theme is presented very simply and, and sparely, and then it comes back in this huge, glorious transformation. Um, let me give you an example of that, from the, especially from the A-flat ballad. That's the one I can play the best. Um, the opening theme, and then what happens at the end of the piece, what he does with that little slender little theme, which sounds like a duet between a an upper voice and a lower voice. So here's the opening of the A flat major ballad. too much fun. Uh, the musical elaboration of his melodies, it's called developing variation. The gorgeous examples in the nocturnes. Um, the precedent is, is there in Mozart. There's a wonderful piece by Mozart called the Rondo in A minor, which feels like a romantic piece but in a classical structure. And Chopin knew it well. And remember he loved Mozart, he knew all the operas. Um, let me play for you the opening of this Mozart Rondo in A minor so you can see what happens with the developing variation of the melody and then we'll do a Chopin Nocturne which has a similar kind of development. Okay, so here's a bit of the Mozart Rondo in A minor. <laughs> Thank you. 
one of the best examples of the developing variation of the opening theme, opus nine number three. So these opus nines, these are the ones that were dedicated to Camille uh, Playel's wife, Marie, Marie Mouk, Madame Camille Playel. And she was a wonderful pianist, serious pianist. She ended up running the conservatory in Brussels, the, the piano department there, and she played concerts, European concerts. She played in a concert in Vienna with Liszt, but she and Liszt had a little fling in Paris and used Chopin's apartment without his permission. And Chopin found out about it. And um, it, this was r extremely painful and, and drove a deep wedge between what was already um, a tenuous friendship between Chopin and Liszt because of the competition and just the whole different attitude of the two of them. They were two different animals completely. Liszt is very competitive and Chopin not in that way. But you realize Chopin is a play ill artist. It's like being a Steinway artist. He was a play ill artist. He was very good friends with Camille Playel. And Liszt was an Erard artist. This is the competing piano firm at the time. It's a heavier instrument with a big sound, which, which he needed because he put so much force into the instrument. <clears throat> so here he is having an affair with the wife of the Playel firm CEO in Chopin's apartment. And Chopin finds out about it. And so it was, it was, <laughs> it was not pretty. Um, anyway, but these three nocturnes were dedicated to her, I think, as a wedding present. This was the year that she married Monsieur Camille Playel, and, but she was, she was so flagrantly, serially unfaithful to him, they, they quickly divorced, and then she went on her merry way and had her career. But anyway, but here's the beginning of the, I want to do the, no, the third one, because it's got this incredible, playful development of the melodic line, which you'll hear a little bit, of something reminiscent to what Mozart just did in the Rondo in A minor. three of those nocturnes from um, Opus 9 are beautiful, wonderful things. The mazurkas are the wildest children of Chopin's fantasy, and I wanted to just play you a fragment of one. I just discovered that these are all, these are new, so I'm just struggling to play the examples for you. Um, really striking, and, and what he does harmonically, and these were the passages that puzzled both Mendelssohn and Liszt and said, why does he do that? That is it's just so harsh. And it seems like it doesn't belong there, like it was cut out of another piece and just dropped in. They didn't get it. But also because only Chopin could play these pieces in the, in the totally convincing way that revealed what his intention was. This is um, C sharp minor, opus 50, number three. And I'm just gonna skip, I'll play the opening, which is very, very simple. And then at the end, I'll go to the end where this harmonic passage happens was quite incredible. The first indication in the music is mezza voce. It's a vocal indication, mezza voce.
it's too delicious. I wish I wish I had time to play the whole thing for you, but I, I need to learn it better too. I want to end with um, a list piece. We've covered lots of, you've had a really <laughs> a master class in piano technique, the history of piano technique today. Hope it hasn't been too um, detailed for you, but I mean, these, these are the things that were completely revolutionary that no one else was doing. And then after he did it, everyone said, well, but of course, that makes total sense. And the, the composer that, that most, most is on the same page with Chopin, so far as using the instrument as a piano and not trying to turn it into an orchestra, is Debussy. And we're going to talk about that in the next coming weeks. So here is a consolation by list. It was written in 1850, just after Chopin died. Chopin died in October of 49. And then Liszt, you know, quickly wrote that long letter to his sister saying, oh, I'm going to write an homage, a little pamphlet about Chopin. Could you please answer these 15 questions, intrusive questions? And then the, the book came out and it was, it was dreadful and it wasn't about Chopin at all. And then he wrote this consolation, which is in D flat major. And it's very similar to the Chopin nocturne in D flat major. And its major uh, harmonic shift point goes to a C flat, which also the, I mean, it's kind of copying the harmonic plan of the Chopin nocturne. So here it is. It's his homage to Chopin. See what you think.
Liszt Consolation in D flat, written in 1850. Okay, well, I recommend for listening this week that you listen to the, the Chopin 24 etudes. They're, they're superb music. They're not just mindless exercises. They're, they're incredibly inventive and creative and difficult. And my favorite recording is the early one by Vladimir Ashkenazi. There are two, and there are many, many, many pianists have done this, but that was the first one that just took my breath away, and I, I thought, oh my God. And a friend in university gave me the LP, beautiful copy of this when it, when it was released and said, Melinda, eat your heart out. <laughs> so, yes, there's nothing better.